Good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar uh, and also some new faces. Um, so my name is uh, Rui Costa, and I'm the director and CEO of the Columbia Zuckerman Institute. Um, welcome to this Brain Insight Lecture, sponsored by the Stavros Niakos Foundation. Foundation. The Zuckerman Institute um, was built with the premise that really understanding how the brain and mind work has the power to transform science, to transform society, and to actually improve brain health. Our scientists do this every day, and you'll have a preview of it tonight. And programs like tonight's lecture bring the science out of the lab and to you. In fact, tonight, they bring it to more than you, because this is being live streamed. And beyond being live streamed, as we talked many times, the lecture series are translated into curriculum materials for uh, students by the Stavros Niarchos teacher scholars. Our teacher scholars are New York City high school teachers who bring the latest advances in brain science to the classroom and to teachers everywhere through download, downloadable lesson plans. So not only they give it in their classes, but they prepare it for classes everywhere. And so this program has reached uh, many people. Both the teacher scholars program and these lectures are made possible through the generosity of the Stavros Niakos Foundation. Thank you so much. And they have been a true partner in our public education efforts. I wanted to invite you, so if you're just involved in one or another of our um, public communication or public uh, outreach efforts, we have a number of programs and events that go from children to families to adults, and we encourage you to explore those and join us again in those events. Uh, of course, a lot of the work we do at the Zuckerman Institute would not be possible without the generosity of Mort Zuckerman and the Green Foundation that helped establish the Institute. So tonight, we're very fortunate to hear from very two talented scientists at the Zuckerman Institute, Dr. Sarah Woolley, who will be our speaker, and um, Dr. Amy Norovich, who will be our moderator. And as it has been now um, traditional in our new format, they will do the show, and Amy will introduce uh, Sarah Woolley, but I will introduce Amy, because one of the things we want to do is promote uh, the young talent and actually help young scientists develop. They are the future. So Amy is a promising up-and-coming researcher um, that did her PhD at Columbia and continued here, and now is at Dr. Andres Bendeski's lab at the Zuckerman Institute. And she investigates how the brain controls behavior. More specifically, she's looking to find out how visual cues can elicit aggression in Siamese fighting fish. And um, the differences between male and female fish responses. This may seem a bit out there, but we believe that a lot of the understanding of the fundamentals of how the brain works. Eventually, that's how we improve society and, and brain health. She has received numerous prizes for her work and is currently a junior fellow of the Simon Society of Fellows. So please help me welcome Dr. Amy Norovich to the stage. Rui, thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you all for coming today. 
Many neuroscientists work with one of a small number of animals, like mice or flies, that have been cultivated over decades for use in research. And this focus on a select few animals has allowed us to dig deep and understand the workings of the brain in minute detail. But convenience comes at a cost. The questions that we're able to ask are limited by the natural abilities of the animals that we study. Mice and flies alone, for example, don't exhibit the full range of behavior on display in the animal kingdom, and they differ from humans in some obvious and some not so obvious ways. So today I have the pleasure of introducing someone who has taken a very different approach to neuroscience, Dr. Sarah Woolley, a neuroscientist at Columbia Zuckerman Institute. Dr. Woolley studies the natural behavior of songbirds, animals that possess a rare ability to learn communication vocalizations. Young songbirds learn a complex sequence of sounds during a small window of development, and they do this by listening to a parent and practicing, similar to the way in which human babies learn to speak. So studying songbirds allows Dr. Woolley to ask questions about how the brain facilitates language acquisition and social communication. Dr. Woolley's career has been dedicated to the study of these birds. She completed her PhD in neuroscience at the University of Washington, Seattle, and completed postdoctoral work at the University of California, Berkeley. In 2006, she joined the faculty at Columbia and soon after was named a Searle Scholar. It's a prestigious award given to young investigators. She's now principal investigator at Columbia's Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute and the Kavli Institute for Brain Science. I find personally Dr. Woolley's work to be very inspiring for its unique approach to understanding how the brain drives behavior. So after the lecture, she and I will have a brief conversation about her research and its broader relevance to society. Members of the audience, all of you, will then have the opportunity to ask her questions about her work. I know that there are a lot of students and teachers in the audience today, and we would absolutely love to hear from you. So please try to think of some questions for us after the talk. The title of today's lecture is Singing in the Brain, How Early Experience Tunes the Brain for Social Communication. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Woolley. Okay, how, how can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Well, I'm delighted uh, to be here today for, uh, to give you a sort of a short lecture and then have a conversation about um, something that the Columbia University, that the Zuckerman Institute, and that the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation uh, understand well, and that is that the young brain has almost magical abilities to learn, acquire behaviors, Etc. And it's one of the most fascinating mysteries about the brain is why is the young brain so wonderfully good at learning and why does learning uh, uh, slow down as we get a, a, little, a little older. Um, perhaps the best uh, example of this, anybody want to yell it out? Speech and language for us. Without speech and language, we would not be the species we are, we would have, there would be no culture, there'd be no education. We, we depend on our hearing and our voices as our major forms of communication. And this is a lovely depressing, do we have a point? Anyway, I'll just point. Okay, so this plot is depressing, I know. Uh, this plot shows us uh, that young brains learn language best. As we age, age is plotted on the x-axis here, as we age, uh, we get worse and worse at learning language. We've all, on, we've all seen this, right? So if you move a child from Spain to uh, New York, okay, and the child is six years old, and the parents are 35 years old, okay, you move the family, the kid has picked up English in a month. All right, and the parents are struggling, working on it, going to classes at night, etc. So it's, there's something built in to the young human brain that makes us ready, makes us almost know how to acquire language using our voices and using hearing. And that's what this plot shows here. So, uh, you know, 
it's kind of depressing. We can still learn language, but it's very, uh, it's very tough if you're older than right around puberty, right before puberty. And so the question is, what, 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 is, what is the difference between the brain when it's young and the brain when it's older? How does the brain prepare you for learning something as incredibly complex as language when you still can barely crawl across the floor? Okay. So <clears throat> we study this with a focus on the auditory system. And that, uh, we all think of voice, 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 okay, for spoken language. But in fact, your learning of your native language or any language begins with hearing. And so early experience of native language <coughs> sounds shapes the way you hear for the rest of your life. And it happens in the first year of your life. The native language sounds you hear organize your auditory perception skills around those sounds and you have that organization in your brain and the way you perceive sound for the rest of your life. And that early organization of the auditory system sets you up for being able to acquire, copy, learn, and perfect the vocal sounds that you use um, to learn in speech. We don't have a, you, have you noticed there's a pointer? Okay. Okay, so let me, okay, so how do you know that, Sarah? Okay, the, these, there are many hundreds of papers that are published that demonstrate this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, okay, so how do you do it? Well, you test babies about the way you test birds. Okay, and that is, this is called the head turn test, and it was developed in the 1970s. Okay, here's mother, here's the experimenter, here's some speakers, and here's our subject. Okay, you can't, you know, a, a little child is not going to tell you, yep, uh -huh, I heard the difference between that and that. Nope, you have to be trickier. You have to be more crafty in your experiments, just like with birds. And so the mother, mother can hear nothing. She's got headphones on. The experimenter can hear nothing that's going on in the room. But from this speaker is a sequence of sounds. And the example I'm showing you here is ra, 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 la, ra, ra. And naturally, when a repeated sound switches to a different one that you recognize as different, whoop, a ba the baby looks at the speaker. Okay, so the baby looks up because he heard that la. Okay, and then he gets rewarded, he or she gets rewarded by this little toy, pee, 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 pee. and then they, ah, they love it and they learn, they're, they're, suddenly they're trained. Okay, okay, and the, the, so, so this is how you test babies. And once this sort of, very simple, straightforward, but crafty uh, example was developed, then early perception of the phonemes in, in English, Japanese, Hindi, different, different languages could be tested, okay? And so it turns out, and this is where we first learned that language learning using speech begins with the auditory system. So if you take uh, babies who are Japanese infants and American infants, at six to eight months old, and you test them on their ability to distinguish the dif difference between ra and la, they're equally so-so at it, okay? But by 12 months of age, the American infants are much better at discriminating ra and la, and the Japanese infants have decreased in their ability to discriminate ra and la because they are forming their perceptual skills around the phonemes of Japanese and Japanese doesn't have er and lu. In fact, they have a phoneme right in the middle. So there are examples of Hindi and Spanish uh, phonemes that, we, that English, native English speakers can't hear. Okay. So this is just uh, the, the, the famed ra la dis discrimination. Okay. <clears throat> so later on, if you look at the brain, uh, we're looking at the side of a human brain here, this gray thing, okay, and same over here. And later on, you can see the markers of this organization of your perception and of this learning in the adult brain. And this is, these red areas are showing neural activity, when neurons in the brain are firing like crazy, when you're presenting, okay, ra versus la. And this is showing the difference in the brain's response to ra versus la. And these are native English speakers, these are native Japanese speakers. So these are all the areas that respond to speech sounds in the brain, but the signal is much higher in the native English speakers because they hear the difference between ra and la. Okay. 
Okay, so you can look into the brain, you can see, see that this is, this is clearly represented biologically, but we don't know how it works. Okay, so what, what do you do when you have an amazing capacity that you need to understand to help kids learn, to help hearing delayed, hearing speech delayed kids develop properly? How, how, how do we understand what is going on in the brains uh, in, when we are learning to, to use our voices and hearing to communicate? Okay, so here's what we do as scientists. We go out in the world and we look for an animal who does it too. Okay, this is what we do. We'd say, okay, who, who, are there any animals out there we can study in the lab, okay, who do, who do this too? And the answer for speech for a long time was, there's nobody. No monkey, no ape, no mouse. They don't learn their vocalizations. They use vocalizations to communicate, but they are built in, okay? They don't learn them, all right? And so this was a you know, bummer for several decades until it was discovered, guess who? Guess who? Not another mammal, not a primate, but a bird, okay? And it turns out that three types of birds learn vocalizations. We also now think whales and bats do as well. But they're, you know, imagine the lab I would make Columbia build if I were studying the whales, you know? So, uh, it turns out that parrots, you guys have heard of those, songbirds, and hummingbirds are all brilliant vocal learners. And so we use these animals in the lab to ask, why is the young brain so good at vocal learning? What limits vocal learning as we age? And how does, how, what gets organized in the brain when we're listening to our native language sounds as infants that permanently affects the way our brains process sound and permanently affects the way we how well we use speech. Okay. So songbirds are brilliant vocal learners. There are about 5,000 species, okay? And this is the one uh, that, this is the, the major one. We study multiple species, which I'll tell you about, but this is the major one that those of us interested in this study. This is the zebra finch. If you walk into the pet store nearest here, okay, and they have any birds, they're gonna have the zebra finch. They're very happy living at, you know, in somebody's home, in a classroom, or in a laboratory. Okay. And so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you the magic, okay? So during this, during, this video's short, okay? During this video, a magic thing is happening, okay? I'm just gonna show it to you because it doesn't seem like there's gonna be magic. Come on now. Okay, that's the baby, that's the father. It's cutting out a little bit. Okay, so believe it or not, within a minute and 15 seconds of being exposed to an adult singing, a baby bird has formed a memory, has copied that tutor song into the brain as a memory, okay? And I'm gonna skip this because people have seen it before. Okay, so I'm gonna, show, I'm gonna explain to you how this learning process goes on and what we know about it. Uh, so, <clears throat> The parallels that we see between a baby songbird and a, a baby human is that they go through the same developmental stages of vocal, of vocal learning, okay? And they use the same general capacities. So first, both listen and form auditory memories of the sounds of the, that, they, that they are going to learn to produce and to understand to communicate. Then they experiment Okay, I'll play these for you on the next uh, slide. Then the experiment, blah, 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 blah. we're all used to babies, blah, 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 okay, the birds do the same thing. Then they practice, we work on it. We listen to ourselves, we see if anyone understands us. We listen to ourselves, we perfect, and we get better and better, and then we end up with 
uh, the ability to speak and understand speech, and birds end up singing at the age of adulthood, okay, at, which, is, which is luckily for us in laboratory science just three months, okay, with a beautiful copy of that tutor song. Okay, so here's a little layout of what, how it works. Okay? We think hearing actually starts, these are, they, they hatch out like we are born, just these little pink nothing, you know, useless, little <laughs> helpless creatures. Okay? And so we think they start hearing, unlike a duck who starts hearing in the egg, uh, they start hearing after they hatch. All right? And then a, a, what we call a critical period, a critical learning period opens at age 20 days in which they listen and memorize, as you saw here, okay, the, the tutor's song. And then later they practice and perfect it. And the way we know they memorize it is because you can take daddy away, take the tutor away, okay, back here when he's just listening, and, and he will later produce a lovely copy. Okay. So then he practices and he perfects, and then at sexual maturity, Boom, his song is perfectly stable and stereotyped and does not change for the rest of his life normally. Let me play. Okay. Sub song. And they just do this, you know, in the corner of the family enclosure da -da -da, to themselves. Then they practice. Can you hear some rhythmicity beginning there? And then they stabilize. I'm going to play this also. Okay, that's the dad song. Did you hear the similarity? Okay. So it's an amazing process. Every, everything we learn, everything we remember, every, every, every motor gesture we can produce is because of the firing patterns and properties of neurons in the brain. Okay? So we know that there are important changes happening in the brain during these. And we study those to uh, map what we learn from the bird back on to humans. Okay, so. <clears throat> Now, why does the bird? Why is the bird's brain set up like ours is to, to take in little a little bit of information and and form a whole behavior out of it? Well, that's because, for the male who sings in this species, females do not sing; they analyze the male's song. Okay, so in birds, like in almost all animals, okay, mating is what we call male-male competition, female choice. <laughs> okay, so the males all compete. They're not all that picky. Okay, <laughs> they're just competing to get a mate, and the females shh, must do an analysis on the males. Okay, and say you out, you out, you out. Okay, yep, you're good. Okay, and so and the males, so they have they have got to learn this song, or they're in big trouble. Okay, and we can prove this in the laboratory by raising birds without any tutors. We have them in a family, we remove the males, the mothers take care of them, They're, they grow up, and they sing, but they sing a disaster. Okay. And it's called isolate song, okay? And no female will have anything to do with that male. Because something did not go right in his rearing, okay? And so, a tutored male, Okay, these repeats of syllables, and here's the isolate sound. Ah, uh, come on, you know? <laughs> and, the, and it's over for him, okay? Luckily, they don't seem to know it, because we have lots of these in the lab, and they just keep on singing, and they're happy in their social environment. Okay, so uh, the difference between this and this is the difference between learning and whatever your genetic programming gives you. Okay, the other thing that's, that's very useful for us is <clears throat> that, you guys probably know this, bird song is species specific, meaning that 
different species sing very different songs. And the way we uh, look and visualize, look at and visualize sound is with these spectrograms here. So you can see all the acoustic patterns. And if we look at the zebra finches song, which you've heard several times, <laughs> harmonics, kind of noisy, okay? Well, here's another species, the long-tailed finch. Well, he sings very differently. Let me show you the difference. Oh. We just got a little audio delay. Okay, you've heard the zebra finch, okay, right? Here's the long tail. That's very different. So within a species, the male's songs are unique and individual to each male. But these, these two look more similar and sound more similar to each other than they do to this, this, or this. And this is the Bengalese finch. OK, so we're going to use this as a tool. That's why I'm taking you through all of this. So the songs are learned, but they're also species. That's the other species, Bengalese. Okay? So the songs are learned, but they're species specific. Okay? So this combination of who you are genetically or genetic identity and what you've learned in your social environment come together in, in the song. Okay, now, <clears throat> how does all this learning take place? How does a female analyze the male's song? How, how, does, how does a male listen to what he's singing and match it to the memory and perfect it? Well, it's all through all the processing of sound information in the brain. And this, these are the major forebrain, these are, these are, this is the auditory pathway, we've all got it, from the ear, through some processing stages, up to the cerebrum, what we call the cortex. And this is, these are the sound processing areas of the, um, of the songbird brain. And we, they have different processing layers, information comes from the lower brain, kind of goes to this area, then goes to this area, then goes to this area, and then shoots back down, okay? Somewhere in the processing of sound and the, the way neur neurons are responding to song uh, achieves perception, okay? And so we, uh, we want to understand how it is that the sounds you listen to and that you learn uh, to pay attention to affect uh, the sounds that you use to communicate. So there has to be a connection between the motor output of song, what are the sounds being produced by one bird, and, what, and the auditory perception of the other bird. They have to be mapped onto each other by species, and then in the case of mates, by, by individuals. Okay, so we, <coughs> we use multiple, these different species, to ask the very simple question, where are the brain cells, where are the auditory brain cells tuned to four are particularly crazy responsive to the sounds of one's own species? Okay, and we did that by studying the zebra finch versus the long tail finch. And we breed all of our animals in the laboratory. They meet, they fall in love, they court, they mate, they raise the young, they tutor the young, and they grow up to sing and females grow up to analyze the male song all in the laboratory. It's, it's invaluable, okay? And so when we uh, do this with these, two, uh, with these two species, they have the same areas. If you just look at the brain, you just look at the neurons, they look the same, okay? But something is different. And what you do is <clears throat> you present this song, zebra finch song, to the zebra finch and to the long-tailed finch and you measure how much the brain is responding to this song, okay? And what we see is that when we present zebra finch song to both of these birds, that zebra finches' posterior parts of the auditory system go gangbusters, okay? <coughs> Huge responses. And the long tail finch is like, eh, you know, I'm hearing something, you know, but. <laughs> And exactly the reverse is the case. If we present the long tail finch song to both of these birds and then we look at how their brains are responding, okay? 
So we then, <coughs> by virtue of, I'm you know, simplifying this and making it a little more straightforward, but by virtue of years of studying these different species, we've identified the part of the brain that is tuned for the vocal sounds that you use to communicate as a species, okay? But what's the, what's the problem with this, okay? The problem is you're not just a, a particular species, you're also a function of your early experience. You're also a product of what you experienced when you were young. So are these neurons particularly responsive to this song because, because this, because this long tail learned long tail finch song? Okay, and the same with the zebra finch? Well, in the laboratory, you can test that. Now, and here's how we did it. This looks complicated, but it's really simple. Wait, how am I on time? Okay. <clears throat> it's, I swear it's simple. We've got our zebra finches, we've got our long tail finches, everybody lives in the same colonies together. Okay, <clears throat> now we bring in the Bengalese finch. Each species sings a very different song, okay? <clears throat> and we set up a little experiment that is the parallel of this, and we wouldn't do this in people. You take two brothers, born in Lithuania, okay? Two twin brothers, and you take one, uh, let's think of a good, interesting country, you know. You, you, you put one in Spain, uh, and, you, and you put one in, uh, you know, Sweden, okay? So you've got brothers, twins in this case, okay? Not identical twins, fraternal, okay? And, but they grew up learning totally different languages, okay? And the difference between those brothers, the way they hear sounds and the way they use sounds to communicate, okay, is a function of learning. It's not their genetic identity. Okay, so we, so we did that very experiment, but in the birds. And so we took, <clears throat> okay, we took two brother, two brother zebra finches, and we put one in a nest of, of a family of zebra finches. We put one, we take them as eggs, we put one in the nest of a family of Bengalese finches. So half these brothers were zebra finches, but they thought they were Bengalese finches, okay? Same thing with the long tail, okay? And luckily, the Bengalese finch will raise anybody, okay? They're the sweet species. So you just give them any, any baby, they'll, ra they'll raise the baby. And so question number one was, if you can hear your, the correct species song, Bio Dad is right over next door, uh, do you learn the wrong species song? And the answer is yes. You defy who you are as a species because the so just like with speech, the learning is gated by the social relationship between the tutor, foster father, okay, and the pupil, the offspring who's being raised, okay. So these birds, our birds defied who they were as a species, and these poor, these poor birds, they learned this bird's song. Let me see if I can play it for you. Okay, here we go, here we go. So we've got this nice, well-controlled, you know, this is what we do, scientists do. We like to control, we have this group and that group, and we control for all the variables except for the manipulation. Okay, so we've got zebra, a zebra finch who, who learned Bengalese finch. His brother learned zebra finch. Same over here, okay. Okay, here's the normal zebra finch. Please play. Hold on. Okay, here's his brother. Pretty different, right? Okay. Okay, that is a long tail. We learned the Bengalese. And here's what normal long tail. Okay, so you can really mess around, you know, with nature. Um, and so, you know, what, what's happened in the brain? Do we see any marker in the neural activity, the auditory parts of the brain? 
And the answer is yes, we do. Uh, okay, so remember I told you these areas were the parts, the part, the the part, the part of the uh, cortex, the, the auditory cortex, that has the neurons that are tuned for the acoustics of conspecific song, my own species song. Well, it turns out exactly these are now, if you were raised by a Bengalese finch, tuned for Bengalese finch song. Okay, so now, okay, so what's the point of all this? Now we go back to, the, to people, and we go back to the people who are working with kids learning speech and language. And we can now say, in your MRI scans, in your measurements of neural activity in kids, okay? This is many of the, you know, many of the diagnostics are looking at neural activity to find out why a speech delayed kid is speech delayed, okay? What we can know, now say is there are parallel areas in the human auditory cortex, which are exactly these. And now we can say, okay, human researchers, look right here for the neural activity that it, it represents a norm, normative development versus a, develop, a development that we need to in, in, intervene with, okay? So what we're doing uh, now is also, remember I told you that the, the learning is so dependent upon the social relationship that the birds will actually learn the wrong species song. So <clears throat> this is true for speech as well. It's very tied to the social relationship between the adults and the off, I like to say, we, we say offspring, children. Okay, and so we are toying with, well, experimentally manipulating, okay. Experimentally manipulating the social factors that make these birds learn really well from their other species tutors and make them say, no, I'm not, this is something's wrong. And so we're tweaking the, the social situation so that we can optimize learning. And that will allow us to then go back to those who are working with kids developing speech and language and design ways to help them learn. That, that I'll end there. I thank you. And we're gonna have a chat, and then we'll open it up to questions. Yeah? Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a wonderful talk. Um, so since it's almost Valentine's Day, you've given me the opportunity yes. to ask the question, brains or looks, right? With these cross-species okay. tutoring right. experiments. What do females prefer? Do they prefer a bird that looks like itself or a bird that sings its species song? Okay, that's a great question. So I, I mentioned that the females in these species don't learn to sing and sing because it's a male courtship behavior, but they do an analysis, right? But when you have eggs, half are male and half are female, right? So when we transfer the eggs from one species nest to another, we transfer just as many females as we do males. So we've also studied this in females. And what they do is they sexually imprint on the, on the parent. Okay, so the females that we raise in the, in the nest of the wrong species sexually imprinted on the Bengali finch. Okay, and so then we ask, we have all these preference assays in the lab where we say, okay, would you, you know, would you prefer to hear this song or this song? Would you prefer to hang around with this male or this male? And it turns out that the females, it's, it's probabilistic, it's not completely 100%, but the females who are reared by the wrong species mm -hmm. are more likely to choose the wrong species. Wow. To, to hang around with. Yeah. Yeah. That is, isn't that amazing? It's pretty cool. <laughs> so you mentioned, um, you mentioned that this is a really unique ability to learn vocalizations right. that are used for communication. Um, and I noticed that you mentioned whales and bats also have this ability. You didn't mention other primates, for example. And I'm wondering what distinguishes humans from primates that aren't able to learn language and how humans, for example, differ from there's this famous gorilla called Coco that learned sign language. You could kind of yes, that's right. Yeah. And Nim Chimsky was here at Columbia. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, okay, so there are two, two issues. Mm -hmm. Vocal learning is defined as the ability to copy <coughs> vocalizations from others and produce them yourself. Mm -hmm. Like a parrot is classic. The songbirds do the same thing, okay? We do it uh, as well. 
so apes, apes, monkeys, everybody we've tested mm -hmm. just doesn't do that. They're not vocal learners. They're not vocal learners. They, they use calls. They use a whole suite of calls. Frogs use calls. Mm -hmm. uh, mice use vocalizations. But they're, they're not learned. If you deafen a mouse, okay, you put some plugs in the, in the baby mouse's ears, the baby mouse develops the same vocalizations okay, as a hearing mouse. This is how you know for sure that these things are learned or not. Um, and so there is something uh, missing in the circuitry in the brain. That uh, here, Many people think there's a, there are vocal pathways that are missing. I think that what is missing in the non-vocal learners and that what evolved in us, lucky, um, <laughs> is the ability for the auditory system to inform the vocal motor system on a real-time basis, mm -hmm. okay? So a frog hears a female call, a male frog hears a female, and then, he's pr and then he produces his call. So he hears, he responds, but he just keeps producing that call no matter what else happens, okay? For us, if, we have, if, if our auditory feedback of our own speech is just a tiny bit delayed, we start stuttering. Okay, the birds do the same thing. Okay, because there's a constant crosstalk between the vocal production system and the auditory system in, in birds, in us, and that does not appear to be uh, a part of the normal neural circuitry in most animals. Now, why, okay, so bats and whales, what is one thing, that what is the only thing besides being mammals, that bats and whales have in common? Echolocation, okay? They navigate using putting out sound and receiving the echoes back. That's how they find their way around. So they, are, so they have evolved for other reasons. Mm -hmm. This circuitry in which he, the hearing system informs the vocal motor system and there's a feedback system. So that's my hypothesis is that the uh, you know, the only two other animals we've found so far that can achieve this crazy uh, skill mm -hmm. happen to be echolocators. Yeah, it's really fascinating. We know in the context of a lot of other social behaviors like parenting or aggression that there's actually a really strong genetic component to these behaviors. Yeah. Do we know anything about the genetics underlying language acquisition or vocal communication in the case of songbirds? Right, okay. So at the level of genetics, uh, we know that there are genes in the vocal motor system of the songbird that are the same, that are, if damaged in the, per in the human, okay, there are families that have this gene defect, they have uh, speech, speech, pro speech production, speech perception, and speech development pro problems. So it's called FOXP2. So we know that there are genetic markers that are shared between the vocal motor system of the human and the vocal motor system of the songbird. But what needs to be done is, is a much wider, more comprehensive analysis uh, of the genetics. And people, people just haven't done it yet. Yeah. What would, you, what would you think would be a good system for looking at this in, in birds or with maybe population genetic studies with humans? Right. Yeah. Um, at what are the genetics of the of the of the of the ability to learn the skill with which you learn? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, the ability to learn uh, to communicate vocally. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, so clearly, there is the the learning process is organizing circuitry in some direction based on what one has learned. First, you as a species have that capacity to learn it. That's one. Okay, part of your genetics. And then there is gene expression and how it may be uh, increased or decreased in certain brain areas, right, by, by experience, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I think people are just constantly asking my colleagues to study more than just the zebra finch. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you could just look at a few different species and get a lot of insight into, mm -hmm. uh, you know, why it is we use the particular sounds that we do 
uh, to communicate. For, for us, you know, we're not different species. We're all the same species. We learn different languages. And we do hear, you know, where, our, where we're most hearing sensitive is exactly where speech is. So there's a, cl there's a clear, obvious, you know, coupling between our hearing abilities and, and our, our speech use, you know. Yeah. But I don't know the origin of it. Yeah. So back to the females. <laughs> <laughs> Do we know anything about why they can't sing? Are there obvious differences oh, yes. in the brain? Yes, biggest sex difference ever females? found in the brain. Wow. Yeah. OK, so in the male and in the female, uh, they both have uh, you know, basically the same auditory system. Mm -hmm. But the male has a set of brain regions that are devoted to producing the song. Mm -hmm. OK? Yeah. And they grow when he's learning to sing. And the female does not have them. But in the species in which females also sing, they do have them. So there's a whole network that is just absent in the female. Okay? But if you inject her with testosterone when she's very young, she grows a song system in the brain and sings. Wow. It's really incredible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and does this, this has to do with maybe hormones? Mm -hmm. or it's yeah, we think that um, testosterone mm -hmm. and estrogen are with many, you know, just like sexual differentiation in mm -hmm. mammals, we think that testosterone is the major uh, global signal that causes the growth of that song control region. Wow. Really cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and in, in seasonally breeding birds, so around here, we have seasonally breeding birds. They breed in the spring and in the summer. And so the males really spring, sing in the spring and in the summer. In the winter, who cares, you know? And so in these seasonally breeding birds, the song control system that the males have grows and shrinks. It grows. It adds neurons and connections among neurons right as the males are getting ready to sing. And that's dependent upon the rise in testosterone in the males when they are getting ready for breeding. Very cool. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, Rui mentioned before that you know I work in a type of fish that very few people do neuroscience in. Yeah. There are more people working in finches than there used to be, but it's still a fairly small community. Right. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little about <coughs> the sort of advantages and challenges of working in a model organism that isn't uh, as commonly studied in the lab. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the I mean, the, the main issue, well, there are several, but the main issue is that people automatically don't grasp, they resist the idea that the brain functions on similar principles in a bird and in mammals all the way up to us. But, you know, the more you, we learn about neuroscience, a neuron is a neuron is a neuron, okay? And s certainly the way they connect to each other varies by species, varies, but but you, you can actually learn so much from animals that is translatable to what we understand. But it's just, it's a hard sell with the birds sometimes. So there's that, okay. <laughs> and then you're just, you're, your intellectual scientific community is smaller. And, and we're, we're like, the, the, we consider ourselves like the maverick weirdos in neuroscience. <laughs> Those of us who, so we're, we're called neuroethologists. So we study the neural basis of you know, we, we like to say real behavior, but um, na of natural behavior. Okay, so I don't want to study, you know, the, the mouse reaches this way, the mouse reaches that way. You know, I, that, I, Sorry, ju I just Marie. don't want to. Yeah, I mean, no, it's genius, it's genius, you know. But I, I for me, I started in, neuro I, I came to neurobiology by, by being interested in animals animal behavior, evolution, how we get to be the way we are. And then I've got more and more and more and more, you know, mechanistic. And so for me, I just, to be able to study the, nat the brain's natural process is fundamental and that leads you to these non-model model systems. And how, how did you start working in songbirds, actually? Because it's not <coughs> such a common choice to no. make as a neuroscientist. Right. So I took a poster to the, to the annual giant <laughs> S, we call it SFN, and we all say it with like a, you know, <laughs> the annual neuroscience meeting, 35,000 people. Imagine your seventh grade science fair, but adults <laughs> and thousands of posters, okay? And so that, we, we actually do that. 
And I, I, as an undergrad, I worked in a lab. I liked science in the lab a lot, and it motivated me more than my courses. So I took a poster, ooh, which was like, ooh, impressive, you know, as an undergrad. And I, I you know, was a little too conscientious, I think. <laughs> and I walked every aisle of the Society for Neuroscience posters every day from eight to five. <laughs> Looking at what what you know what is interesting what who am I you know I was 20, 20 21 okay who what am I and when I hit the songbird aisle <laughs> I had arrived <laughs> it's never happened to me again ever in my life <laughs> I, it had everything it had field biologists and, you know talking to lab biologists it had sex differences it had critical periods in learning and it had social communication mating you know it was amazing and I decided that day that that was, was I wanted to go, go to graduate school to study those and I not not stopped yeah yeah so finally uh, last question what comes next in your research what sort of uh, questions would you like to see answered over the next 10 years oh with songbirds boy, that is tough. okay so here's a here's here's a shocker I'm revealing you know <laughs> the inner workings okay so we've been, just been discussing how song performance, song learning, every bit of it, the maintenance of adult song depends upon hearing, okay? We don't know how the information gets from the auditory system into the vocal motor system. We still don't know. <laughs> it's, it is, it's just, it should be so simple, you know? It should be so easy to understand, but we don't yet know exactly what and from where the information in the auditory system informs and guides motor be, mo vocal behavior. And so I would love to focus on that and really finally figure that out. That's great, that's the frontier. Yeah. <laughs> so we're at the point now where we can open this up for questions from the audience. Um, my colleagues will bring microphones around. Um, Please keep your questions brief, and we especially want to hear from teachers and students if you have any questions. Thank you so much for your magnificently clear and fun and engaging talk. <laughs> um, where does the analysis happen in the female brain? It, it happens in those auditory areas that I showed you right. on the drawing of the brain. Not the prefrontal cortex. It's anymore. okay. So okay. if you were to look at the side, okay, it's basically the it, it's a huge area um, that is the caudal part of the telencephalon, so the caudal part of the of the cerebrum, meaning the back part, and it's the bird's version of auditory cortex. Thank you for this talk. <coughs> I have a question. If, a, for instance, for example, a zebra finch male learns a Bengalese finch's song, will the Bengalese females accept him for mating? Uh, if, if they have the option of a normal Bengalese, <laughs> then they will go for the normal Bengalese. But after a while, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, put, you pair them, you know, you see what happens. She's, she, she, she might. She's more likely than to just go for a, co a completely different species singing them. Yeah. Um, hi, over here. Um, thank you. Um, so I have a question about social bonding versus sexual bonding. Um, yeah. And so when we're talking about like the female selection of males, are they choosing, like, because I know that zebra finches mate permanently, right? Yes. Um, are they, is that social social bonding or sexual bonding or both? It's both. Okay. There's plenty so, of social bonding that isn't sexual. That isn't yeah, yeah. Pit mating. If so, you just put two females together, oh, they will just, oh, they will form a pair and, right. you know, they'll build a nest. There's nothing, you know, much going to happen, but right. um, they will, yeah. Um, so my question is, I, I was curious about this, so I did a little research and there's the study by since you guys are a small group, you probably know like Julie 
Ely, is that how you say your name? Her study about if you put just the male finches together, they'll pair bond for oh, life. I, and then if you introduce the, I the, the female females, literature. if you, well, this study is, I don't know, from 2011, I'm, it's not my specialty, but I'm curious. They, they put only males in, and then when they introduce females later, five out of eight male birds decided to stay with their male mates um, yeah. as a social bond, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a good if, marker of a social bond. Yeah, yeah, if you, in the absence of like this, gen, uh, this sexual, sexualized diversity, will their brains develop um, the sophistication of audio receptive reception that, that the females have in the absence of male? Oh, I see, I see. Um, or do you know? The you males, know. Yeah. in the absence of being, being assessed by the females, yes. will, as far as we know, yes. So they'll develop the sophistication that the female birds have? In, you mean in song or in, in social? No, in their brains, like their, yeah, their, no, their audio, the ability to discern songs right. with the sophistication okay. of the female. Because if, if, they're, if, they, um, if they're tutored, if they're raised around males, if they're tutored, they will, they will have just the, they have very, very similar auditory tuning to males that have been raised around males and females. Yeah. So it's just that the, the male brain develops a like sophistication of production, but the female brain- Oh, they would do that just with, two, okay. with males around as well. So there's no special qualities that the female brain develops that the male brain doesn't develop? Okay, so the, they both have to have a great auditory system, uh -huh. but they kind of have to have them for different reasons. And the very basics of their auditory systems do not differ. They're the same. So how do we know that the females have a more sophisticated system than the males? Or they don't? We, we don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood the yeah. data then. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We don't know that. Yeah. In the early stages of brain plasticity, did you try to teach a bird more than one language? Can they learn more than one song? Okay. Um, <clears throat> the yeah. So so a bi like a bilingual bird. That's 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 the way we toss it around in the lab, right? Okay. So we have done that, and it did start as a bit of an accident, but. Um, we, okay, so what we did was we have uh, one of our species, uh, we have eight species in the lab. One of our species, they're not very good at taking care of their offspring, okay? So sometimes we have to rescue the, uh, the little hatchling and they, they go, they have to be, they're fostered by those lovely Bengalese finches who will raise anybody, okay? So then once they're all old enough to feed themselves and, you know, then we move them back with their parents. Okay, so that was a way of getting the babies to, to thrive in, you know, f with feeding and care by the Bengalese until they could go back with their parents and their bad parents, okay, and be tutored with the correct song. And so what ended up happen happening was when, the, when those babies grew up to be adults, they sang both Starfinch and Bengalese Finch, okay? And so we were, oh, what, what? We created a bilingual bird. So now we're doing it more and more and figuring out whether they do Bengalese starfinch, Bengalese starfinch, or whether they jumble the syllables of Bengalese and star together. It's a great question. So what do you think uh, evolutionarily drove these songbirds to uh, care for a finely tuned song? It doesn't seem to increase fitness or, you know, um, it doesn't seem to improve the okay. survival of the offspring. So it, what do you think does. actually? Okay. So, so song, s song quality, first of, as measured by the female choice, but then also measured acoustically, does correlate with reproduc reproductive fitness of the males. So, they're, so they're, they're better providers, they're healthier, and um, one, you know, one of the, you often, most, in most mammals, the female is selecting for genes because mommy and daddy meet, they mate, and daddy's gone, okay? But in birds, both, both sexes raise the offspring, like in people. And so when she's selecting a male, she's not just selecting genes. She is selecting someone who is going to co-parent, who is going to help with the resources, and all of that, okay? And the song, is an indicator that he was raised right, you know, in a way. <laughs> his, 
his brain works, okay? <laughs> and, and some indicator of genetic fitness. Yes. Um, it may be a little off topic, but have you, have, has there been research on why parrots are the only ones to mimic human um, speech? Okay, so parrots are extremely good copiers. They're not the only ones. So a star, we had a starling, uh, a pet starling in, the, in, the, in my friend's lab when I was in graduate school, Doug, Doug the starling, <laughs> and he, he copied uh, syllables from, he, he, you know, whistly syllables, you know, um, from, from our, our voices. But the parrots are just so good at it, okay? And they're usually, the parrots we know are, are, have been reared around people. They're extremely social, socially affiliative, okay? So they're more likely to copy human sounds, even though they can copy in virtually any sound you throw at them. And the, so, so they are very bonded to the people who they live with. And so we think that's why they more clearly and more often and more frequently copy voc vocal sounds from people, okay, than do say starlings because of, the, because of the social relationship. But a starling and many other birds can, could copy human sounds just fine. How much does uh, Pavlov's experiment um, influence um, your sort of um, questioning of that pleasure principle that might, that might be, or is it, um, present for um, that imprinting? What is, ah. what, I mean, so, yeah. I'll just break it down a little bit further, just what, just what I was sort of thinking about was like, you know, of course the, the, the chicks can't rationalize when their father is singing, but that is, I mean, they're the, they're the result of his beautiful song, right? His beautiful song was successful. And so they, how, how does that learning sort of relate to that reward or some sort of, is, is there a pleasure principle involved okay. in their brain that sort of imprints that, that makes it very sort right. of solid? Right. So that they're able to go ahead and mimic it and yeah. So, they, so one, I mean, one thing is if the, if, the, if the father has a beautiful song, they have a beautiful song to copy as an, as an example. But we know that in these birds, hearing song is rewarding. Birds will do work to hear song. Like a, if, you do, if you do music, music appreciation experiments on animals, they always choose silence. <laughs> you know, any kind of music, we're desperate to find an animal that loves music, okay? And you play, and you play this, this, or silence, and silence, everything. So, so, but birds will work to hear song. And females, and they'll, they'll work much harder when they're young, when they're babies, to hear song. And females who are in breeding condition will work harder than females who are not in breeding condition to hear male song. And the, and the adult males don't particularly care to hear anybody, any other male song. So we do have these little pleasure principle uh, indicators that, that we've worked out. And dopamine, we think oxytocin, we think these neuromodulators that are in the bird brain as well are mediating this, but we don't, we haven't worked it out. So I'm just curious, do, is there, a, in terms of this, the vocal reproduction, mm -hmm. are there differences in um, different species, say, I, I don't know where the sound takes place. Is the beak, is the shape of the beak an element? Okay. When you're talking about, you know, birds right. of different species being raised by other ones, and right. is that a factor in yeah. what they're able to, to reproduce? And, yes. al and also, yes. is it a factor in what they're able to learn? I don't know. Exactly, yes. So we have, we've been doing these cross-tutoring now to try to work out what are the rules by which one species can learn another species, okay? And so some of my species, like the Bengalese, cannot learn the long tail, okay, song. But the long tail can learn the Bengalese, okay? And so one of the things that we've learned is that in a species uh, that's being cross-species tutored, okay, the babies, if they learn it at all, they copy the syllables really beautifully. Syllable A, B, C, D, gorgeous, okay? And we run all of our acoustic analyses and on them, you know? And, but then they'll put them together in a syntax that is like their native species. 
Okay, so the zebra finch sings A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. And the long tail sings A, B, C, D. Okay, and so if you teach them both Bengalese, okay, the zebra finch will copy the syllables and turn it into okay, and the long tail will take the same song and turn it into done, you know. So that, that was, that was uh, I was making that, you know, I haven't done those before. But so, so it's, it's as if the morphology, like the phonemes of, of, of spoken language, you know, those can be written in, you know, by experience. But somehow the tempo, okay, which is very species specific, is built into the circuitry of the brain by, by your species. And whether that's in, in on the auditory, sensory side, or the motor side, we don't yet know. That's one of the things we are pursuing. Um, sorry. Where are you? Over. Over Got here. you, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm wondering about, uh, I guess, the structure of the input. Um, so for example, if you took um, the bird who wasn't tutored, um, who had that sort of chaotic song, mm -hmm. and then you had that bird raise baby birds, would they impose structure onto the song that they okay. were? Okay, great question, and there is an answer, okay? I have a colleague who's at Hunter, and here's what he did. <clears throat> he took, uh, he founded a colony okay, in a sound isolated room, okay, so there could be no other influences. He founded a colony with isolate singing males, okay, and then he let the generations, okay, and he found that by the fourth generation, the songs were normal, okay? It's a nature, it's a nature paper from, I think, 2006 maybe or something? It's worth looking up. So there is, there, there is some you know, built into me as a species, my neural, my, my native neural circuitry, there is some driving force that affects behavior. It doesn't all just come from external example. The learning here is uh, phenomenal. And I just wonder besides the auditory cortex, any other parts of the brain like a hippocampus, even lower level structure, such as the brain stand, salamus actually involved in the learning? Okay. So we have, we asked that, um, we, okay, so <clears throat> you could start at the cochlea, okay, and then you work your way through the auditory brain stem, then into the midbrain, then into the thalamus, and then you go up to the cortex. So <clears throat> at the level of the cochlea, we don't think there's any specialization by species, okay? In bats, okay, who echolocate at very specific frequencies, you could see it at the cochlea level, there's their, specialization, their brains are specialized as well, but so we don't see any real clear differentiation, okay? And then, <clears throat> and we don't see that all the way up to the midbrain. We don't see it. So I, we've said, my lab has studied the midbrain, how it processes sound, and the midbrain is, those neurons are not tuned for song, okay? They love noise, of all things. It's how you can drive the midbrain. And in fact, in, you know, it, it turns out to be that the first processing station in the cortex, the, 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 the layer uh, of neurons that gets the input from the thalamus, not tuned for song, okay? It's through, the, this, through this hierarchy, this, this circuit processing hierarchy, that the specializations, the tuning specializations emerge. So that's great for us, because then we can take this brain area where the first processing station isn't specialized, okay, and we know the end, the, 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 the later processing stations are specialized, and we know somewhere in there are, is the transformation that learning confers to the brain. Hi, I have a question. You said the bird will work for the song or for the sound. What do you mean by work for it, and how do they work for it? Okay, so you can say, uh, he, um, Here's a little key. Here's a little key, okay? And 
and you know you can have this key and this key and this you have three keys okay that are just little like rock you know we glue a tiddlywink onto a little electronic switch okay nobody knows what a tiddlywink is anymore <laughs> i can't believe it a little disc okay and we say uh, do you peck none of them or do you peck some more than others and that's that is our assay, that's one of our simple assays of preference. So one will play zebra finch song, one will play Bengalese finch song, one will play long tail finch song. And so she, she, if she doesn't, so we tip her off, you know, we convince her to peck it by putting some seed, millet seeds on it. She pecks it, she hears the song, okay, pecks it to eat it first. But then she's like, oh, oh, a song played, okay. So then, then comes the test. Do you bother? to peck the thing or you just go about your business, okay? And the males will just go about their business, okay? But, but the females, as soon as we put them into the testing chamber, beep, 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 press, 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 and the babies do that too. So that's what I mean by work. Make an effort. What factors do we have to be able to understand to be able to delve into how this process works in humans? Okay, what factors, right. Whew, that's a big, 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 big question. <laughs> well, there are, uh, let's think about the levels of factors, right? There's the social environment uh, into, the, into the family environment, into the cochlea into all these processing stations, into the cortical areas that we know, that we are pretty darn sure are specialized depending upon the language you, you learned. We, behavior tells us that, okay? And that's just the areas, right? That's not which are, which are the brain cells that are driving all of this, right? So, and is it, you know, is, is all this encoding happening at the level of hundreds of cells or one special cell? Or, see, this is the kind of thing we, we grapple with. And so um, the, e the, the most, the strategy is this. We work immediately on the social factors because we can, we can manipulate those in our world and for a, for a kid, okay, while we're discovering how the brain works, which is a, it takes takes time, okay. So it's sort of a parallel, sort of straight, more straightforward, okay, external world factors, and then we're we a lot of a lot of what we do is just saying, okay, how does this system work, okay? In order, you can't fix anything unless you know how it works, and so that takes longer than manipulating, you know, so, social. Uh, cues and, and that kind of thing. So it's basically a parallel path with the sort of external factors putting in to a child and then what's going on inside. Is that helpful at all? Slightly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a super satisfying, it's a big question. you know. <laughs> like it would be nice that if I just said, okay, it's going to be solved next week, you know. Hi, thank you so much. This has been so interesting. So I'm curious to, if I understood correctly, in the cross-fostering paradigms, the species are all living together, is that That's correct? Right. So all of the, the chicks are hearing multiple kinds of songs. That's right. So then if I understood correctly, it's the emotional experience that the, the babies are having that they get taken care of by a certain kind of male yeah. who makes a certain sound, and then that's the one that they start to copy, yeah. right? We don't go quite so far as to say the emotional experience, Wait, but we, we, we define it as the social relationship, the social proximity. Yeah, so there's yeah. A, so the, 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 something about being cared for, yep. yes. it makes that yep. sound be salient, that's which right. obviously is very relevant to the human condition. That's right. Because also the, the whole time I was listening to you talk and I'm just thinking about how deeply felt our specific culture and our family sounds are. You yeah. know, just thinking about like the music that we remember from yeah. you know, what was on the radio when we were twelve. It's just That's like right. deeply in the fibers of our being, similar right. to this. I would like to, if I could, go back to the beginning of your lecture, which had to do with 
the difference between how well people learn depending upon their ages? Yeah. Uh, I'm a retired lawyer, and I've had a lot of uh, uh, witnesses in trials of different ages. And it's not a representative sample, to be sure, but I noticed what seems to be some kind of a difference with certain young witnesses and, and <laughs> thank you, and older witnesses with respect to dealing with specific things and general things. And I was wondering, with respect to children uh, and learning, if the, if, if the uh, but children are learning initially uh, what you might call the use of singular terms, and then later they're learning to acquire the use of general terms to describe. And I wonder I if as we get older, if our dependency up upon general terms might interfere with the learning. Ah, okay, so the idea is that you, um, you learn things very in very high resolution, and then you sort of group them and figure out their connect connectivity, their their how similar they are, and kind of cluster them and group them to organize things. And that maybe as we age, we like focus on the grouping and then we sort of lose the high resolution discrimination. Okay, well, that's a hypothesis. That's a hypothesis? I, I don't know. I don't know. Hi. Um, does manipulation of any other external factors affect, like manipulation of senses, such as light or um, the temperature of the room or visual aids affect okay. their ability to learn? Right, okay, so the, the broadest answer is yes, because the, the light, the temperature, the humidity, uh, their light-dark cycle, all of these things play into their health. And so we very carefully control these things and optimize them uh, because it can't, because w when you're sick, you don't learn as well, you know. And so in the real world, 80% of the offspring in these species don't even make it to adulthood. But e even in, say, you know, people's homes or whatever, the conditions under which one is living affects learning. And you can see that very clearly in the birds. So we, we, we optimize that for them. They also, um, you know, what you feed them affects plumage, okay? And plumage is also a, ro you know, romance, you know. <laughs> courtship, look at me and my cheek, cheek colors, you know? And so what you feed them also uh, is important to, to the learning. Um, so my question is about the mechanism of learning. And you said this is still a question of how the sensory information is projected, or the sensory system is projected to the motor system. And I was wondering if this is uh, somehow connected to so-called mirror neurons or the mirror mechanism. Right. Have you looked at it, or what yeah. is your opinion? So, so there are um, there there is there is one good paper in which um, mirror neurons were reported in the songbird, and so there's this the there's a, a brain area back here, okay, that we call premotor, okay, and it. Um, responds to presentation of a bird song and, and encodes and fires during the production of that bird song. So that's like mirror neuron, but it's me, you know? Uh, and so this area is, it has the closest to something like mirror neurons that, that we would have. But, but it turns out that these, these neuron, the neurons that respond like crazy to the bird's own song and fire during the presentation of the bird song is, uh, is only true when the bird is asleep. So when the bird is awake, the, the, audit, the gating of the auditory information into that premotor area, that kind, you know, presentation of the bird's own song, is shut off, okay? So it can't, you know, the way we thought it was getting in there is not right. And so we're looking for alternative routes. But mirror neurons is a, is a concept that many people have looked into. 
my question is, um, in human beings, do boys with better singing voices attract more girls? <laughs> I'm not just being funny because I want to know whether any of this behavior translates to human behavior. Okay, so, uh, so singing is one of our many ways of showing off yeah. as humans, right? We have so many, you know, choose so many. So singing is one of them. Performance of any kind has a little, you know, could be re used in wooing a mate, could be used in impressing competitors, you know. So we have many. I don't know if there are any real studies in which uh, singing ability has been quantified and then the person has been followed <laughs> to see how many children they ended up with, you know. <laughs> Frank Sinatra. <laughs> There is a paper actually on reproductive fitness in Oscar winners and how it goes, it's way be outside of the normal curve. And also Elvis Presley. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, for this amazing lecture and thank you, Amy, for moderating. So I hope you can uh, take from these that when we talk about fundamental knowledge about how the brain works can impact not only what we know about the brain but about society and brain health, you know many times we think about brain health as a pill, but it could be changing our education system. It could be changing when we teach certain things. The impact of these things can be more valuable for society than a pill. So, Think about this. Anyway, thanks again to the Stavros Niakis Foundation for their sponsorship and all the support in these lectures. Thank you for you, um, to you for coming. And we hope you join us in our next lecture, The Art of Choosing, which is going to be on April 29th. And Dr. Uh, Shina Yenger from the business um, uh, school is going to be here to talk to us. So have a wonderful evening. Thank you, and go singing away. <laughs> <laughs>